afternoon, everybody, and happy new year to you. Hope everybody had a good holiday season. Good chance to take a break. Um, my break, my gift to you for the new year is that I do not have an opening statement, so we will get right after it. Go ahead, sir. Um, I'd like to start in North Korea. Um, Kim Jong-un and his New Year's address said that um, North Korea was um, preparations for doing an ICBM test for reaching a, the final stage. Yeah. Wondered if you had any reaction to that and um, if you've any indication that a, that a test is um, a missile test of some sort is in the work. Um, well, as I think you know, um, generally we don't um, talk about intelligence matters or intelligence assessments with respect to uh, specifics about um, the capabilities that they continue to pursue, both on the ballistic missile side and, of course, uh, on the nuclear side. So I'm not going to uh, get into characterizing uh, or confirming the veracity of, of the comments in his, um, in his New Year's speech. What I will do, though, is, as we have before, continue to call on the DPRK to refrain from provocative actions and inflammatory rhetoric that threaten international peace and stability, um, and we want them to make uh, the strategic choice to fulfill their international obligations and commitments um, and return, fr frankly, to the six-party talk process. Um, there have been multiple UN Security Council resolutions uh, that explicitly prohibit uh, North Korea uh, that launches uh, using ballistic missile technology. They are still in effect. Um, and we continue to call on all states uh, to use every available channel and means of influence to likewise make clear to the DPRK and its enablers that launches using ballistic missile technology are unacceptable. Um, of course, to also to take steps to show uh, and to prove that there are consequences to uh, this unlawful con conduct. So um, we're certainly aware uh, of what he said. Um, uh, we're obviously aware of the capabilities they continue to pursue, and that's why uh, the United States continues to work with the international community uh, to hold uh, Pyongyang uh, to account uh, for the pursuit of these capabilities and for the, uh, <coughs> the instability that they're contributing to. I would remind uh, that the, the sanctions regime uh, put in place recently is the most str stringent over the last two decades um, and, that, uh, uh, and, and that they are being implemented. So um, I guess we're just going to have to, you know, we're going to have to uh, obviously watch this uh, going forward. But, uh, but the international community um, uh, is clearly galvanized like it hasn't been before. Do you have any way to convey these these um, ideas directly to North Korea at this point? Uh, well, you know, we don't have uh, direct diplomatic relations uh, uh, with, the, with the North. Um, but f frankly, um, I mean, in a sense, I'm, we're doing it now as we do when we talk about this publicly, uh, and we certainly have made these exact concerns um, and these exact statements uh, well known and, and clear through the UN, through the UN and the UN Security Council. Um, so Blinken is meeting with um, his counterparts from Japan and South Korea later this week. Yes. Um, those those talks um, have, were already scheduled before before yes. the statement. But is there anything that this this um, is there anything you can do, or or the, the way the discussion could go, given this latest uh, statement? Well, I mean, first of all, Leslie, I uh, I think it's safe to assume that uh, North Korea will be on the agenda um, uh, in the in these trilateral talks, and this is I think the sixth round of these deputy foreign minister uh, trilateral talks, and the deputies very much looking forward to it. No question that. Uh, tensions on the Korean Peninsula will will be a, a, a topic uh, of discussion. Uh, where that's going to take us, what's going to be said, um, especially in light uh, of uh, Kim Jong Un's speech, I, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that we'll obviously be providing a readout of the discussion, uh, and so when it happens on Thursday after it's over, we'll we'll be happy to do that. And then what is the U.S. assessment? I know you say don't talk about intelligence, but um, what if he's lying? I mean, <coughs> what if this is just an empty, empty threat? What is your assessment? Um, I mean, is he close to 
Is I, this the last stage, or is it? Just I think the the intel. Uh, my understanding is that um, again, we don't talk about intelligence uh, issues. Um, so that's one. Number two, uh, uh, we we do continue to believe that he continues to pursue uh, both nuclear and ballistic missile technologies. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty apparent. We do not believe that uh, he, at, the, at, at this point in time, has the capability to tip one of these um, uh, with a nuclear warhead. That's as far as I can, uh, I'm going to go in, in terms of uh, assessing. But, but we do know that he continues to want to have those capabilities, and he continues to, the programs continue to march in that direction, which is why quite frankly, that the whole international community is as galvanized as it is uh, to try to deter and to stop that. Um, now, yes, there's a very stringent sanctions regime in place, no question about that. Sanctions take a long time to work, we know that. Uh, sanctions are only as good as they are enforced, and, to, and, and in, in past sanctions regimes, it hasn't always been uniformly enforced. Uh, China has said they will enforce these, and that's uh, that's our expectation that they will that they will, that they will do that. I will also remind that we also we, we you know that there is a military component to the Asia Pacific rebalance that the United States has pursued, and uh, we have the majority of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific region. We've moved special radars into place. Uh, we, we have uh, missile defense capabilities of our own in that part of the world. So it's it's not as if. Um, it's not as if we're relying solely on simply a, a sanctions regimes to, to exert the proper pressure on Pyongyang. We've obviously taken and will continue to take uh, the kinds of measures that we believe is important for, for our own national defense. And since the statement on Sunday, has there been any discussions with China in the meantime about, about this? I, I don't have any discussions with uh, China to read out with respect to this particular speech. Um, you know, but if that changes, uh, we can let you know. Are the apparent, the apparent we'll stay on, we'll, determination. I think we're staying on North Korea. Yeah, yeah. the apparent determination uh, of Kim Jong Un to pursue the ICBM, in despite of what you described as a <laughs> sanctions re regime, is that because the sanctions didn't convince him, or because they haven't been adequately enforced? Uh, I, I can't get inside his head and tell you what what, what enforced. they are being enforced. Um, uh, um, and we're, what I would say is we're constantly monitoring uh, the, the enforcement uh, uh, across the international community. Um, I can't stand here and tell you that they're being perfectly enforced by every single nation, uh, but the general sense is that they, that, that they are being implemented. It is a kind of thing that constantly needs to be evaluated, monitored, and discussed uh, at the UN, and, and I know that it is. For our part, we certainly are. Um, and uh, we expect every other nation to, to do the same. What, what's, you know, what decision matrix Kim Jong-un is using to continue to explore this technology, I really can't speak to. Um, but, but what I can speak to is as he continues to pursue those, the international community is going to continue to stay galvanized uh, against that because it's not just destabilizing for the peninsula, it's destabilizing for the region and, and the world. But it, if they are being adequately enforced and it hasn't stopped them, then you need stronger sanctions or another option. Well, we haven't ruled out the, the possibility of uh, additional sanctions. Uh, in fact, in, in light of the most recent test, there were discussions uh, at, at the UN. And I, I've certainly, you know, first of all, let's not you know, let's not get ahead of where we are. We've seen a, we've seen a, a speech, um, and um, we've seen some rhetoric. Um, I, I'm not in a position to say one way or another that that leads to something imminent right now. So we need to stay where we are and, you know, where things are. And we know that he continues to pursue this. So we will certainly continue to explore options to uh, increase, if needed, the international pressure on Pyongyang. The second thing I say is that, and you know this, sanctions take time. Uh, he has obviously proven uh, impervious to sanction pressure in the past because he continues to explore these capabilities. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that, at least for the United States part, that we're simply relying on sanctions and sanctions alone. As I said, there is a robust uh, uh, U.S. military presence in the Pacific region, in the North Pacific region uh, specifically. We have uh, ironclad security commitments there on the peninsula uh, with uh, Republic of Korea allies that we take very, very seriously. Uh, and so, I mean, it's uh, the entire U.S. government here uh, is rightly, as, they sh as we should be, focused uh, on this growing threat. You called for a turn to six party talks. Obviously, the Iran nuclear deal came out of multilateral talks, but parallel to that, as we now know, the United States engaged directly with Iran, uh, and it was seen by many outside observers that the bilateral ties between Iran and the United States were what bore fruit and brought around the P5 plus 1 deal for the JCPOA. Has there been any discussion about direct contacts between Washington and Pyongyang on this issue? I, I would say just an answer to that. that our focus continues to be on returning to the six-party process. Um, we'll go to, you want to go to that, and then I'll go to you, James. Are you still on North Korea? North Korea. Okay, yeah. so Steve and then yeah, James. Yeah, following up on six-party talks, you, you mentioned, um, uh, you called for them to return to that process. Is that without preconditions? It has, it has always been. Uh, I mean, we, we want them to return. Um, and, and the, but the, the, the condition is that they have to commit to a verifiable denuclearization of the peninsula. That's always been the case, if that's what you mean by preconditions. Nothing's changed in that regard. You know, they've got to be able to commit to denuclearization of the peninsula, um, and they have proven, obviously, unwilling uh, to do that and unwilling to return to the process. Just a few different categories on this subject, if you would. Um, first, is it the view of the Department that China is doing all it can do to rein in North Korea's nuclear ambitions? Chinese officials have made clear that they intend to implement uh, the resolution. And uh, we're engaged with an ongoing dialogue with them uh, to that end, as well as our allies and, and our partners on how uh, to best curtail the DPRK's uh, pursuit of nuclear ballistic missile uh, and proliferation uh, programs. I didn't ask if it is the view of the department that China is doing everything it can to comply with the resolution. I asked if it, it is the view of this department that China is doing all it can do. No, I, 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 I understand the question. Uh, I'll leave my answer as it is. <laughs> um, is it fair to say that China is doing nothing on the North Korean problem, as, no, as President-elect tweeted? I would not. Uh, we would not agree with that assessment. Um, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said today, uh, apparently in response to the President-elect's tweet, that uh, we hope all sides can refrain from speaking or doing anything that can aggravate the situation. Is it the view of the Department that the President-elect's tweets are, in fact, aggravating the situation? We're not taking a position on the President-elect's tweets with this uh, or, or any other issue. Uh, he, uh, um, what we are concerning ourselves with, James, is um, continuing the, to see international pressure being applied to Pyongyang to make the right decisions. Um, and as I said, uh, the international community is galvanized like it's never been before. Does that mean that every country is implementing every single one? Uh, of the sanctions that are in place on any, on any or every given day, uh, of course not. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to see that happen. And it doesn't mean that the sanctions that are being implemented are, in fact, still the most stringent that have been, been in place uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. So um, uh, it, it is – what I will say about China is that it is clear uh, that – they are absolutely concerned about the direction that Pyongyang is taking. Um, and one shouldn't be surprised by that. I mean, the DPRK is, is a southern neighbor, and they share a border. Um, they have been concerned about sanctions in the past because their southern provinces do direct business uh, in North Korea. Um, but they did sign up to these very robust sanctions, um, and 
and they have publicly committed uh, to implementing those sanctions, and that's going to be our expectation going forward. Two last questions. To your knowledge, has any official inside the Obama administration at any point taken any steps to initiate direct diplomacy with North Korea? Not, not to my knowledge, James. Lastly, is it the view of the department that, or let me rephrase that, does the Secretary of State proceed from the assumption that Kim Jong-un is a rational actor? <laughs> does the Secretary of State presume that... Proceed from the assumption that in attempting to deal with this regime in whatever mechanisms we use, that he is dealing with a rational actor? It is, um, uh, it, it's difficult when you look at the decisions that, uh, that, that he is making, the programs that he is uh, pursuing um, in, the, in the face of, of international will against him. Um, it, it's difficult to understand, as I said to Dave, uh, the rationale um, uh, in making those decisions and in pursuing those programs. Uh, which are clearly coming at the expense of his own people, clearly coming at the expense of security and, and stability around him and his own citizens and in the region. Um, but I don't believe that we are, uh, that we are pursuing the options that we are pursuing um, based on a litmus test or a view or, or a... Um, uh, uh, you know, or a, a, a personal assessment of his psychology and, and the degree to which he's rational on any given day. Um, we are, however, pursuing these options based squarely on what we see in his actions. It's hard to get inside his head, but it's pretty easy to see from his actions. I mean, this is a man, mind you, that executes his own officials using anti-aircraft gunnery. What does that tell you? It, it tells me that, and I think it tells the world, uh, that he is, that he is utterly brutal um, and continues to rule with uh, an iron fist. Um, and, uh, uh, and because of what you can gather from his actions and the brutality, obviously, that he's capable of, and continues to um, to demonstrate um, that you have to take him seriously when he issues threats, and we do, we always do. So um, I, I know I didn't perfectly answer your question because I didn't. It, you know, it's not that we're looking at this from a, psycho a psychological perspective, but we certainly are judging him based on his actions, and his actions bespeak utter brutality. And we have to assume that that is the basis of the decisions that 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 is at least a a part of the basis of his decisions going forward. Can we move on? Yeah, I, please. Sorry, Can we move on? Uh, are we done with, are we done with uh, Korea? Just one more. Okay. So has this recent statement uh, accelerated anything as far as THAAD deployment? I have no operational uh, decisions to read out to you one way or another. Uh, uh, I would refer you to my counterparts at the Defense Department to speak specifically to that, So, because I'm just not um, – uh, I'm not really uh, uh, informed enough to, kn to know uh, where the discussions are on, on that. You'd have to talk to the Pentagon. Okay. You're still in Korea? You have one more? You mentioned that uh, you, um, the U.S. doesn't believe that North Korea has the capability to, um, to tip put a nuclear one, warhead on one of its missiles. To tip one, yeah. Does that, does that mean any kind of missile, a short-range missile? I, I, th I think I'm just going to leave it at that. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to leave my statement where it was. Uh, yes, I... Yeah, thanks. I want to go to the Palestinian-Israel issue. Sure. Uh, since we haven't had a chance to discuss the Secretary's speech last week, uh, for which you've gotten a lot of flack. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, you know, absent any mechanism to... I, I would uh, also say, say, there, there's been an awful lot of international support that, for the Secretary's true, comments, including from Arab countries. A lot of international so, support. So, uh, certainly... In your in your Please, statement, yeah. I, I know yeah there's there's been some criticism. There's right. been an awful lot of international support. I understand, and and uh, I think there's been overwhelmingly international support. But we're talking about you know this town. Uh, this town has been very 
scarce in, in giving you the kind of support. Well, again, I, I, don't, I don't know that I'd agree with that, but okay. go ahead. Fine. You know, uh, of course, uh, the, the speech came uh, in the aftermath of Resolution 2334, uh, which said that uh, the, the settlements were illegal and so on. Now, but uh, I reviewed all the settlements that preceded it, which is 446, 452, 465, 478, and they are all, they all had much stronger language. But the reason the, the settlement went unabated and with such, a, uh, with such vigor is the fact that there was no mechanism. So would you recommend, you know, either would you take some steps now and in the remaining time that this administration has, let's say between now and the 20th, to perhaps introduce a mechanism to make these, to make good uh, on these uh, uh, UN resolutions? Or would you recommend to the coming administration, you know, su suggest a roadmap on how you can come up with the kind of mechanism to give teeth to these resolutions? I, I don't have any future actions to read out or to discuss uh, on, on this issue. The Secretary's uh, speech, which came on the heels of the resolution was uh, was very clear about uh, the concerns that we have uh, about the viability of a two-state solution uh, and he laid out principles in there uh, in that speech about how a framework if you will about how we can uh, uh, better achieve a two-state solution but uh, specifically beyond that, uh, I don't have anything to discuss with you. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the point that he made, and he made six clear points and so on, and in fact, uh, they probably find their root in the six points that were made by former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton back in 2009. The point is, absent any mechanism or absent the, the, the will and the desire to sort of uh, say, if you don't do this, we will do this, as, you know, introducing sanctions, whether it's against Russia or Iran or Iraq and so on. Absent that kind of mechanism, what good, uh, the, uh, first, the pronouncement of these principles are, or even issuing resolutions at the United Nations is? Well, uh, Said, I think the resolution speaks for itself, and I think the Secretary's comments also speak for themselves, I mean, in terms of uh, our, our continued deep concern. Um, a, a, about the viability of a two-state solution. I don't, I understand your question. I, I don't have any, uh, any additional actions to speak to today. Um, uh, the, I think we're all aware um, uh, about the calendar and, uh, and all aware that uh, we're not going to see a two-state solution achieved in the next three weeks. I, I think everybody recognizes that. Um, and the next administration will have to make decisions and, uh, and, and move forward in, in the way they deem fit. Um, but the President and the Secretary believed it was important uh, to make clear our concern because uh, we want to see peace uh, there. Uh, we, it was important for us to lay out, uh, for the Secretary, excuse me, to lay out uh, what he believed were the, the, the proper principles for, for trying to get there. Um, so I, I think um, I know this isn't a perfect answer to your question, but I think that's I think that's the best way to leave it. One last question on this, if I may, uh, Dave. Uh, now we know that uh, the secretary has always been quite vigorous in pursuing his own initiatives and so on. Are we likely to see anything? The secretary on his part? pursues the president's initiatives. And Absolutely, I'm saying, but but also the the secretary has in implementing U.S. diplomacy and, and U.S. vision. So are we likely to see, you know? added impetus, let's say, over the next couple of weeks to see the Secretary perhaps go to this uh, peace conference in France that takes place and so on, or would you have new ideas and so on to discuss at the, maybe at the UN or other forums? Well, without getting ahead of the Secretary's schedule or his specific intentions on this or any other issue, um, I, I said, uh, and I've said many times in the last several weeks that uh, until he is no longer Secretary of State, uh, this is an issue that's going to be important to him uh, and that he is not going to stop focusing on. Last week you saw that, uh, I think, very clearly in a, in a, in a very eloquent speech about um, uh, our concerns over the situation. Um, so I'm not going to speculate one way or another about uh, how he's going to spend uh, each of the days that he has left in office uh, on this or, or any other issue, but I can tell you, uh, because I'm confident what I said weeks ago, uh, that until he's no longer in the seat, uh, this will be uh, something that uh, he continues to work. Dave, did you have something? Oh, that, was my question. that was your question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Go ahead. 
Um, my question is about President Hollande's visit to Erbil yesterday, and it's got two parts. First part. The visit was very cordial, and President Hollande met with President Barzani, and they, President Barzani took the French president to the front lines. He, President Hollande praised the Peshmerga in their fight against Daesh, promised them continued, and promised them continued support. Do you have any comment on this visit of President Hollande? Uh, we typically don't comment on the travel of foreign leaders of other countries. I mean, um, uh, what I can say is we welcome France's contributions uh, as part of the coalition to counter Daesh, um, and uh, certainly uh, uh, welcome the continued support that has been voiced by uh, President Hollande uh, for the fight against Daesh there in the region. And the second part, in in this meet, these meetings, the Kurdish leadership stressed the enormity of the burden that they bear in hosting 1.8 million displaced people. And President Hollande himself arrived with 38 tons of aid in his plane. Is the U.S. looking into this issue, perhaps? Into the, the issue of, humani of, of the burden that the Kurdistan region bears because it has, it's supporting 1.8 million displaced it, people from it, other parts of Iraq. It's not that, you know, we are looking into it. We have been uh, uh, concerned with this issue for a long, long time. Um, we continue to work closely with the Kurdistan regional government uh, uh, in helping to facilitate the well-being of those displaced people, the people that were displaced internally by by Daesh. We also work with uh, uh, other Iraqi provincial governments and the government of Iraq and Baghdad um, to better foster the conditions that will allow these people uh, to return home safely eventually. It's part of the, it's, it's all part of the, the larger effort. I got you. Just let me finish. I'm just getting warmed up here. It's all part of the, the larger effort uh, to deal with this, uh, to deal with this, uh, this problem. And we want, we're mindful of the toll that displaced people uh, do have on local economies and local infrastructure. Um, all of us can do more. I would also remind that the, the United States um, has provided more than a billion dollars in humanitarian aid since 2014 alone. Uh, we've also rallied the international community, other nations, uh, helping secure pledges just this summer uh, of over two billion dollars. Uh, from partners for humanitarian assistance, uh, stabilization, demining, um, all in the run-up to the Mosul operation. And we're actively working with our humanitarian partners, non-governmental agencies, to prepare for the immediate shelter needs uh, of a large-scale displacement or continued large-scale displacements. And just as of late November, uh, uh, approximately 12,200 is the number I'm given here, of shelter plots uh, across eight sites remain ready to receive households uh, that were displaced from Mosul uh, and surrounding areas uh, with additional plots now uh, under construction, all with U.S. help and assistance. So um, it's not as if uh, we're, we're just now looking into this. This is something that we have long been concerned with since the very beginning of coalition operations against Daesh. Okay? It, it sounds like despite the U.S. generosity and help with this, it's, it's not really enough that more is required even. As I said, I think when we address this issue more specifically about Mosul not long ago, uh, we're always analyzing, always assessing, and always willing to contribute more if more is needed. Uh, that, that's part of part and parcel of the discussions that we are actively having uh, with local, uh, regional, and national government figures there in Iraq. Okay? Yeah. Uh, recently, there was a dialogue held between uh, Russia, China, and Pakistan on Afghanistan. Uh, last week, uh, uh, does the U.S. welcome this dialogue, uh, or what are your thoughts about it? Uh, well, I mean, look, we—I'll uh, say what we welcome is any international effort to help Afghanistan become secure uh, and more prosperous, um, and. Uh, we continue to support, as we always have, an Afghan-led reconciliation process. We still believe that's the right way to go here going forward. Uh, that hasn't changed. And our support for President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah remains steadfast. Um, but nation states, and Afghanistan is a nation state, um, has every right and every responsibility, quite frankly, for the betterment of their own people to have uh, uh, 
whether it's multilateral or bilateral discussions uh, with, uh, with neighboring nations and nations that aren't neighboring, uh, that are interested in the same goals that we are. So you're saying that without Afghan government being present there uh, at the discussion, and they did lodge a protest about it as well, their foreign minister, that... Uh, I, I wasn't... Well, we obviously weren't there either. Uh, so I can't speak to the specifics of this, this meeting, but to the degree that uh, the countries are meeting to discuss uh, the same secure, safe, prosperous Afghanistan that we all want to see, um, and they can come up with ideas to pursue that in keeping with mandates from the international community, um, and in particular NATO, uh, those can be, con they could be constructive. Now, one of those efforts with regard to bringing peace in Afghanistan is about the recent deal that the government made with the Hikmatyar's party. And uh, according to some report, the government has sent a letter to the United Nations to remove his name from the terrorist list. Uh, what is the U.S. government's stance going to be about uh, removing his name from the Well, the sanctions, be okay? sanctions committee consultations are confidential, uh, and we don't talk about them. So I have nothing to I have nothing to provide you on that, right? Uh, uh, do you know, do you have some readout about secretary call or talk with uh, the Pakistan's finance minister Tar or Indus Water Treaty? Um, I can confirm that he did speak on the 29th uh, uh, of December with finance minister Dar. Um, I'm not going to read that out in any great detail. Um, the Indus Waters Treaty has served, I think as you know, as a model for peaceful cooperation between India and Pakistan for now 50 years. Uh, we encourage, as we have in the past, India and Pakistan to work together to resolve any differences. Has the U.S. offered to mediate on this issue between India and Pakistan? As you know, there are some disputes between the two countries on this issue. Uh, as I said, we encourage India and Pakistan to work together bilaterally to resolve their differences. Has it talked to the Indians also on this issue? We're in uh, regular communication uh, with the Indian and Pakistani governments uh, on a wide range of issues. I just don't have any more details for but you. But not at his level, right? I don't have any more detail for you. Okay, thank you. Small question to the center. China recently invited India to be a part of the CPAC. What uh, is the U.S. Uh, recommendation or suggestion to India and on this issue? This is issue? an issue between uh, India and China. I, I don't. I don't have a U.S. reaction to that right now. Okay. Question yeah. on Egypt regarding uh, Ahmed uh, Maher. He's the co-founder of the April 6th youth movement. He was arrested a couple of years ago and was supposed to be released today. There's been no word about his release. I wonder if you have any comment on that, or if you would urge the Egyptian authorities to release him. I, I don't have anything for you on that side. We'll have to take that question and get back to you. I'm just not Okay, and the that. other thing is, uh, you know, since we are on human rights, uh, yesterday the UN Human Rights Council was formed and elected Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, China, Cuba, Iraq, Qatar, Brunei, Bangladesh, United Arab Emirates to the council. Uh, I guess, you know, they, they pick uh, members uh, on the basis of the, on, uh, you know, on the merits of their own record of human rights. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I, I think I would just, you know, broadly speaking, um, uh, we're pleased to be a member uh, to the UN Human Rights Council. Um, after completing a mandatory, mandatory year off uh, in 2016. Since joining it, we've made remarkable strides toward helping the Council realize its full potential, working in partnership with a wide range of member states and often in spite of Council members that have poor human rights records. Uh, we're proud of our successes at the Human Rights Council uh, since we joined the body, including the creation of commissions of inquiry for Syria, North Korea, and Burundi, for country-specific resolutions on Sri Lanka, Iran, uh, and Burma groundbreaking resolutions that were focused uh, on the promotion and protection uh, of the rights to freedom of assembly and association and the first ever resolution in the UN system which created an independent expert uh, on violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So we're going to look forward to continuing to work with other members of the Council to strengthen and protect human rights around the world. And we're not bashful about calling it like we see it when it comes to human rights violators, wherever they sit. Okay? Steve? Yes, um, the deputy commander of Russia's Pacific Fleet in Manila has announced plans to hold uh, 
joint military exercises with um, Philippines Navy, which I think mostly consists of a couple of old U.S. Coast Guard boats at this point. Um, in light of the security treaty between the United States and the Philippines, does the U.S. welcome this sort of uh, cooperation between the Philippines and, and Russia? The first thing I'd say is the, the defense relationship between the United States and, and the Philippines remains very, very strong. We do have uh, security commitments, alliance commitments, uh, that we take very, very seriously. And that defense cooperation um, uh, has always been provided at the request of uh, Philippine uh, administrations. Uh, so our overall mill-to-mill -mill relations remain robust. They remain multifaceted. Uh, and that's the way we want to see it continue. I think I'd let the Philippine government and the Russian government speak to the degree of their bilateral uh, uh, defense relations uh, and, and how that um, is taking shape. I've said many times, and this is a good example of it, that, that uh, you know, foreign relations uh, aren't binary, right? It, and, and these choices that countries have to make are not binary choices. Um, and uh, every nation state has the right to pursue um, uh, bilateral relations of its own choosing. Um, and so, I, again, I would leave it to both of, the, both of their governments to discuss it. What, what I can promise you is that it won't affect how we view the importance of our, bi our bilateral relationship uh, uh, with the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any update on Senator Cardin's letter to the Secretary a few weeks ago about um, the request to formally apologize to State Department personnel who were fired during the <clears throat> Lavender Scare in the 1950s? Any update on that? I, I don't have an update specifically for you on the response to the Senator. We are, uh, uh, we will, uh, of course, respond uh, to the sen Senator appropriately about that. Look, we all recognize that this was a, a troubled part. Uh, of our history here at the State Department, um, uh, but uh, but beyond that, I don't have a, a specific update for you. And when we do, uh, and when we can speak to it, we'll let you know. Michelle, Syria, any comment on the so-called ceasefire there and the preparation? Well, you said it best, so-called, right? I mean, look, um, uh, as before, we wanted to see this one succeed um, because we think it's important to get back to political talks, UN-led political talks. And um, you're not going to be able to do that if bombs continue to be dropped on the opposition. Um, so we would have liked to have seen uh, this latest ceasefire uh, be a success. As, as far as I know, at least before coming out here, uh, there are areas where it does appear to be holding and there are areas where it doesn't. That is not at all atypical of what we've seen in the past uh, with prior uh, uh, ceasefire or cessation of hostilities uh, attempts, whether we were involved with those announcements or not. And we weren't always involved with everyone in the past, um, but we um, sadly have seen this one uh, begin to unravel pretty much as quickly as they have unraveled uh, in the past. So, and uh, is there any uh, coordination with the Russians regarding the Astana talks? Not that, Did that I'm secretary aware. talk to not that uh, I'm aware. Mr. Lavrov? Not that I'm aware of. No. Spoken with him on any issue related to Syria I don't have any in the last recent, few days. I don't have any recent discussions with former Mr. Lavrov to read out. Okay. Are you are you? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, seeing that Mr. Lavrov was the person to call for tit for tat, you know, with the expulsion of of the Russian diplomats, it was Mr. Lavrov that called for tit for tat, and it was the Russian president that actually held back. Do you have any comment on that? I mean, considering that I've seen press reporting on that, Saeed, but I can't confirm can, the veracity of confirm the, the internal have, Russian deliberations. Fact, I, hmm? Hmm? He, he, you don't have any confirmation that he, in fact, wanted American diplomats to be no, expelled. No, I, I, I can't confirm what the foreign minister's views were about the president's decisions last week. Um, uh, we all saw President Putin's statement, which you have to assume speaks for the Russian government. What deliberations and discussions uh, they had internally prior to the President Putin issuing his statement, I, I simply have no idea. There's been no conversation between the Secretary and the Foreign Minister on the issue of the diplomats. I, I don't have, uh, let me just make sure that I'm checking this correctly here. Uh, no, I don't have any recent calls with Foreign Minister Lavrov to, to read out with respect to uh, the President's <laughs> decisions uh, last week. We'll take the uh, last one. Go ahead. On, on Syria, do you have any information about an airstrike that happened today in the, in the north of Syria, in um, Idlib province? 
um, the the Fatah al Sham front is saying that 20 people were killed. I've seen some uh, I've seen some very uh, early uh, press reporting on that. I don't have any update for you. Uh, I was just apprised of that myself just before coming out here. I would encourage you to reach out to my Defense Department colleagues for more information on that. Okay. You know, Fatah al Sham is the same as Nusra, correct? Uh, so they're claiming you don't you don't take their claims. Don't take. Work I mean, uh, they, they're the ones that claimed that 20 people were killed. Yeah, no, I, 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 I know that, and I know who they are. And, okay. uh, Al, Al Nusra is how we still refer to them. Uh, I just don't have any specific information on this. And again, I think the Defense Department is probably better to speak to it than me. Thanks.